you, Susan, and uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Walker webcast. Uh, I continue to receive emails and texts about my discussion with James Kerr, author of Legacy, uh, from two weeks ago. Uh, that discussion has been watched by over 67,000 people uh, on YouTube replay. Um, and I had someone at Denver International Airport walk up to me out of the blue last week and say that he just finished listening to the podcast on his flight from New York to Denver. Um, while discussions like the one I had last week with Matt Kelly of JBG Smith and with Stephen today are primarily focused on the commercial real estate industry, the discussion with Kerr on culture and leadership is applicable across industries and contained lots of life lessons. Speaking of life lessons, we have Bob Glazer, renowned TED Talk speaker and Acceleration Partner founder joining us next week. And then the following week, we'll be joined by John Cotter, renowned Harvard Business School professor on leadership to discuss his new book, Change. Um, it's gonna be a real kick for me to have Dr. Cotter on the webcast as he was my leadership professor uh, back at HBS in 1994, which is dating both Dr. Cotter as well as myself. Um, hopefully he won't be too critical of my leadership style um, during our discussion in a couple of weeks. And then in the middle of September, uh, I'm going to do my first live Walker webcast uh, interviewing with uh, Eric Resnick, C CEO of KSL Partners, to discuss the hospitality and leisure industries as KSL owns lots of hotels, resorts, and ski areas. Um, after having done over 60 Walker webcasts all remote, it will be super fun to sit down with my guest one-on-one -on -one and have an engaging interactive discussion. So talking about engaging interaction discussions, it's a true pleasure for me to have my friend and amazing CEO, Stephen DeFrancis, joining us today. Walker and Dunlop and Cortland have grown almost lot in lockstep over the past decade. And Stephen and his team's amazing success have been a big part of Walker and Dunlop's success. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. Before I introduce Stephen and dive into our discussion, I wanna thank Mike Altman, David Dixon, Brad Brown, Ned Stryker, and the other members of the Cortland team for all they have done to make Cortland the amazing company and partner it is. Stephen DeFrancis is the founder and CEO of Cortland. Since its founding in 2005, Cortland has expanded into a global, vertically integrated, multifamily real estate investment, development, and asset management company. Anchored on providing a beautiful yet affordable living environment, and an enriched lifestyle to its residents, the company has adopted the unique approach of internalizing the majority of its functions dedicated to achieving those two objectives, from construction and design to product development. Stephen and his team manage a portfolio of multifamily assets located in 11 states, primarily throughout the Southeast, Midwest, and Texas. Cortland is the largest owner operator in Atlanta and Dallas, as well as all of the state of Texas. The company employs more than 2,000 associates and owns and manages over 65,000 units today with a current acquisition pipeline that will push that number over 70,000 by the end of the year. Cortland is a National Multifamily Housing Council top 50 owner and manager and is ranked as the top US brand by reputation.com. Stephen earned his bachelor's degree in real estate from the University of Georgia Terry College of Business he is a member of the Buckhead Coalition and serves on the board of the Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partnership. He is also a member of the Real Estate Roundtable, the Urban Land Institute, and the National Multifamily Housing Council. So Stephen, first of all, welcome, uh, and thank you for joining me. Uh, let's back up a little bit to when you founded Cortland in 2005 as a small development firm focused on in-town development in, in Atlanta. And then during the great financial crisis, changing from being a local developer to focusing on acquiring and renovating communities across the country. What was it that you either saw as a macro market opportunity or something that you saw inside of Cortland that made you shift strategy? Sure. Well, first, thank you for having me. It's glad to be here. Um, you know, the first part of your question is what did we see in the broader market um, that, that gave rise to an opportunity. Um, you know, like most of our, uh, most other groups in our industry, we went into the downturn, the great financial crisis in late 07. And, you know, we thought it would be fairly short lived. Um, as it 
uh, drug on and we got into, you know, middle of 2009. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we've been playing defense for two years at that point. We decided to do a pretty significant research uh, project to try to, you know, the goal was to try to determine where the market was going. Um, you know, if you put yourself back at that time in mid-2009, folks were still talking about a double dip. Was the economy ever going to come back? You know, the, the recovery was not as obvious as we'd like to think it would be today. Um, so, you know, we decided let's do this research uh, and figure out where the market's going and at our significantly downsized point at that time, you know, how might Cortland participate in whatever this recovery might look like? Um, and so, you know, we researched really all things related to multifamily, whether it was, you know, supply and demand in the markets that we were in at the time, um, the demographics, you know, market-wise and nationally as it related to, uh, you know, uh, propensity to rent. Um, what was the impact going to be from the meltdown of the single family mortgage crisis? You know, it was all these things moving around in the market or cross currents in the market that we felt might have an impact on the multifamily industry. So we spent about six months, <clears throat> excuse me, with four uh, market study groups, um, just studying different parts of the business. Anyway, two things came out of that. Um, one was, just the, the sheer volume of undersupply that we were going to be met with when the economy recovered or began to recover. Um, that part didn't take a lot to bite off on that. It was largely just math. Uh, the result of um, under development of multifamily in the Sunbelt markets in the early part of the 2000s uh, because of the you know, heavy focus at the time on home ownership, um, followed by a pretty long and protracted downturn where nothing was being developed in those markets. And so at that point, coming out of the downturn, you were looking at, you know, between the 01 recession, the Homer, the focus on the single family, and then the GFC, you were looking at, you know, over a decade of underdevelopment of multifamily. Um, at the same time that because of the echo boom, you know, the, the demand was, you know, growing significantly. So that just pointed to um, an enormous opportunity, um, assuming the market did recover. Um, and we sort of felt like we had to assume the market would recover because if that didn't happen, we had a much bigger problem. Uh, the second thing that came out of that research, which is really what led to the pivot that you're asking about, was, um, you know, we felt, we, we saw the beginning of the transition in our uh, clientele and, you know, historically, the clientele and multifamily had really been, it really had been a very commoditized business. You had folks who lived in multifamily after college, you know, the newly divorced, newly unemployed, newly moved to a new city, um, newly graduated. You know, usually it was a short-term uh, stint. It was a transitional period in most folks' lives. Um, and largely, if you think about it, most folks lived in an apartment until the very first point they could afford not to. So as a result, you know, as an industry, we didn't have a lot of investment in doing it better, better product, better system, better people, et cetera. But we did see that that clientele was likely going to be changing coming out of the GFC. Um, and so we felt that if that were, if that did manifest and we did find ourselves in a market that was going to be uh, tilting towards um, a clientele that had, you know, more disposable income, higher education, you know, was older on average, that would lead to a market really where the previous environment of really commoditized multifamily housing would likely transition to much more of a consumer product and, and really today a consumer service. And so what we began to do is say, okay, let's take those learnings and really pivot the platform to focus on this new environment where the client or our customer needs to be at the center of everything we do. Um, and, you know, that was a bit of a change, you know, for us. And I think a lot of folks in multifamily over this cycle, you know, historically who had looked at their investor as their client, you know, and a lot of folks still look at it that way is their client is their investor. And then somewhere down the, the line, there's some property operations and some folks taking care of the real estate. Um, but we felt that there was an enormous opportunity that we could capitalize on if we really pivoted the whole business to focus on 
our customer as the true client and then create a better living experience, which would, you know, create more demand at our assets and eventually lead to better returns for our investors. Um, the second part of your question is really, what about this change caused us to insource, you know, all these parts of our business? And that, you know, if you, if you believed at that time that we were right regarding the transition in our clientele, which was great as because it meant they could afford to pay more, which everybody liked, but the reality was they were going to demand a lot more from a service level of service and experience than we had been used to providing in the multifamily industry. So we felt that it was going to be important really um, that we controlled all of those touch points with the customer. Um, you know, historically in our business, um, you know, we groups would generally try to outsource as much of the business as possible. Um, you know, sounded great on paper, was a very efficient, you know, and really from the 90s forward, they're, you know, propped up this whole cottage industry of B2B vendors in the multifamily space, where you could buy almost every part of your business on a per unit basis, you know, whether it was marketing or sales or, you know, uh, pest control or landscaping, you know, all these, you know, services you could buy on a per unit basis. But at the end of the day, it was really efficient from a, you know, execution standpoint, but it was really inefficient from a customer service standpoint, because now effectively you were, you know, handing over that relationship with your customers to this whole cadre of third party vendors, you know, which inevitably, as you can imagine, just led to really poor service and poor execution. Um, and so we felt that if we were really going to meet the clientele where we thought they were going, um, what we really had to do is insource all these parts of our business to really control all those touch points. So in hindsight, and now that you've got huge scale and a big brand and incredibly successful, that all makes perfect sense. But I want to go back to 2010 when you owned, I think, 1,200 units and had a whopping eight people inside of Cortland or just the next year when you'd actually grown dramatically from 1,200 units to 5,000 units. But you know, a lot of people at that time may have seen the demographic shifts coming, um, thought that the demographics behind multifamily were really strong, but didn't take the component parts that you just talked about as it relates to a focus on the customer experience, um, a focus on stripping out costs to be vertically integrated to allow you to scale from 5,000 units up to today over 65,000 units. That to me, Stephen, is sort of where the genius happened. And I just want to understand during that period of time, what, what was it that you were seeing? What was the conviction that you had to invest in those two different areas? Because all of us can sit there and say, you know, airlines want to make the flying experience better, but guess what? They have a really tough time making the economics work to make the flying experience for all of us that much better. And so they don't make it materially better. But Cortland really focused on that. And, and part of being able to focus on that was stripping costs out and being vertically integrated. So those two things kind of had to come together to create that better client experience. Talk us through those major moves there or investments that you had to make that were somewhat out on a limb vis-a-vis -vis the competition at that time. Sure. Well, and you make a good point, you know, especially back then when, you know, we were starved for capital. And so making these investments, you know, making investments in the real estate made a lot of sense. Making investments in the platform was really hard to, hard to see through to the upside of doing that. Um, but we, you know, we felt very strongly that the demand was growing and going to grow uh, very quickly. And so we felt then if that was the case, then the next piece was, okay, how could you build a, a, a system or a machine that could create a lot of throughput? How could you really grow the business um, in a way that you wouldn't fall victim of growing too fast. Um, and then while also maintaining that ability to really be best in class from a customer experience standpoint. Um, and so it's, it's really two pieces. It's maintaining that ability to be best to your customer, but also the ability to, the, in the, to create the infrastructure to just process a lot of throughput. And that is really whether it's development or acquisitions or value add, renovations, just 
you know, the whole process of creating product before you then manage the, you know, and operate the product. Um, and so we knew we had to meet both of those things, both of those objectives successfully if we were going to grow successfully. Um, and so part of all of the insourcing was to be able to create a team that could work together to create the product, whether it was developed or renovated, et cetera. Um, if you think about the way most product, you know, most developments are done or acquisitions or value add projects, you know, they are really managed in a very bespoke basis, you know, with an internal acquisitions person or a developer and then external execution, whether it's design or architecture or construction, um, construction management, you know, you have all these vendors working on every project. And so instead of having much like I would say an assembly line would work, it's more like, you know, you're building each one on a bespoke basis with, uh, you know, the project at the center and then all these, you know, uh, vendors working from the out, you know, attached to it, like the pedal to a flower. Well, that's extremely inefficient, you know, building buildings, renovating buildings, especially renovating buildings that are full of customers, you know, it's fraught with peril. There's 1 million things a day that can go wrong and generally most of them will, you know, whether it's delays in materials hitting the site or a sub falls down on the job or, you know, units aren't ready, you know, just you name it, there's 10,000 things that go wrong. And again, they will. And so what we felt strongly was to systemize that process really just to allow us to be able to have a lot of throughput was we had to insource a lot of those functions, A, so you could sort of turn it or the process around from each project being bespoke and turn it into more of a, an assembly line, if you will, where different teams are attacking each project at different points along the process, the, the timeline of, you know, the execution of that project. Um, but also to where all those teams now are working internally that all know our expectations, our systems, our processes. And trust me, we still made half the mistakes that the external groups would have made, but at least we were doing it together. At least we were all one team and we all had one agenda. We all met in the same bar after work to figure out what we did wrong that day. You know, so, you know, we talked a lot about, you know, we're going to make mistakes. That's okay. Just try not to make them more than two or three times each. Um, and those learnings really were helpful because, you know, there were times over the last 10 years where we would have, you know, 10 or 15 pretty major development or renovation projects, you know, and these renovations were, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 a unit. So you're tearing down the clubhouse, you know, you have pretty major stuff going on where systemization for is key to execution. And if you mess up any of those things, it just goes sideways, you know, and, and we could have never done that if we had done each of those with a host of external vendor relationships, as opposed to a, a, a team internally that worked on it, everything. Um, it also made that team work together. I mean, by, um, you know, one of the things we knew early on, if we were gonna be best in class at creating a, a living experience and customer delight, really what we had to do first was make this a best place to work. Um, and it really, you know, it's cliche, everybody says it starts with the people, but it really does start with the people. And so we knew the first thing we needed to do was go build a team of really top-notch players that, you know, were passionate about working here, passionate about what we were doing here, um, felt like they were invested in and really enjoyed, you know, working together as a team every day. And that took just tons of friction out of the process of getting the projects done and executed. But then even more importantly, when you moved to operations, as long as you take care of the people, they'll take care of your customers. Um, but it just, you know, you, you have to set up, an, you know, the infrastructure and the culture of being a, an, an associate first organization if you're ever going to be best in class at customer ser service or customer experience. Um, so given the competitiveness for LP investments and, um, capital out there. In those early days, when you were going and buying properties, um, you were obviously in a very competitive market. You're paying market prices for assets. 
you're um, investing in not only the asset, but also all the infrastructure at Cortland. Uh, I'm assuming you had to get market returns for your LPs, but your GP return dragged as you were investing in the business. I, I find it to be very interesting because a lot of people who get in the acquisition rehab space who raise money from third parties, they focus on their returns to their investors, and then they're also their own returns, and they end up putting a lot of money into their own back pocket in those early days, rather than reinvesting in the company. And what you just talked through, Stephen, was how you had this longer term focus and continued to plow money back into creating the team and insourcing a lot of those activities that you could have bought from third party vendors at a much cheaper cost to the GP. But at the same time, you had this long term vision of creating the Cortland that you've actually created. Well, you know, we, we have learned over, you know, we, we had a lot of learnings along the way. Um, back when we got started, really doing this heavy value add, really no investor wanted to do it. And, you know, Willie, as, as you're aware, based upon a lot of the work we've done together, you know, in those early years, we were raising almost all of the LP capital through a preferred structure. Because frankly, the LPs thought what we were doing made no sense. You know, they, they thought it was nuts to spend that much money on a renovation of an existing project. Um, you know, there are a lot of nights where I was like, maybe they're right. Um, but uh, you know, so we raised most of that capital in a, you know, in a, in a preferred structure, um, and you know, we looked like geniuses at the end because the market went up so much. But we certainly didn't do it because we were smart. We did it because that was the capital that was available. And we knew, and we also structured, as, as you're probably, I know you're aware with our GP fund, you know, we gave some very rich returns to our GP investors. Um, and really that, you know, we knew we had to be best to our customers and create a, an experience and then a brand that would allow us to be, you know, have a premium pricing structure, you know, and create better returns. But we also knew those better returns we had to give up in the early days and pay more for the capital because most of the investors, frankly, thought what we were doing in the early part of the cycle didn't make a lot of sense. Um, but, you know, I don't know if we were really convicted or just really crazy, but we stuck to it and, you know, kept building the machine around that model. One of the most interesting things you talked about brand there, Stephen, and the, and the customer experience. Um, I've seen the numbers as it relates to um how you've been able to build the Cortland brand. There are plenty of people in the multifamily industry who say brands make a difference in hospitality when you go stay at a Marriott versus a Hyatt or whatever else, but that because of the nature of multifamily, someone doesn't arrive somewhere and say, I've got to go find a Cortland asset to live in when they move from Atlanta to Dallas. And I think you've actually proved that wrong. Yeah, no. We felt the brand was very important. Um, it took us a while to really start rolling out the brand. You know, we started with no brand, and that was largely because early on, you know, the first 50 ish assets we bought in this cycle were all REO, whether they were foreclosures or the LP had taken, kicked out the GP. Um, you know, they were all broken in some manner. And so, as you can imagine, you know, a lot of them they were extremely inconsistent from a product and location standpoint. And so you could not build a brand around this hodgepodge of assets. And so in the beginning, we didn't brand at all. And then we started, as we got more consistency, we moved to what we call an endorser brand, where it was whatever the name of the property is by Cortland. And then once we had, you know, a lot of consistency amongst the assets, um, we moved to a true branding uh, structure where every property is branded with our name. And we felt that was important because it, you know, we, we did a lot of research before we did this and, and, you know, learned that our brand actually stood for a high degree of service and customer experience and living experience, frankly, a lot earlier in the cycle than we even anticipated it would. Um, but it definitely has driven a lot of they paid a lot of dividends both in transfers within the system we get an enormous amount of people who move from one city to the next and just go straight to um you know call in straight through the office to find out what's available if they're moving from atlanta to dallas or phoenix to you know florida um 
you know, so that definitely has paid dividends. The real value on the brand more than anything else, though, is, you know, the passion it creates amongst the human capital. You know, when you're trying to hire, you know, it's a war for good talent out there. And when you really want to hire best in class folks, you know, they want to work for a brand that really means something and stands for something premium in the marketplace. And uh, it also really pays huge dividends on the marketing side. You know, our Bill, you know, in markets where we have, you know, 20 or 30 assets in a given market, um, the, the, you know, the way SEO and search works, just having everything branded with a similar naming uh, really helps drive search, you know, straight to our website and straight to our, our, our locations. You talk about the people at Cortland, and I'm privileged to know a lot of them. Um I've been to a uh, I've been to a Mercedes Benz Field to watch your team compete in a in a karaoke uh, uh, band competition, and uh, that was actually quite something to watch. Um, but talk about two pieces of the of the equation, if you will, Stephen, as it relates to what it is to be on the team at Cortland. The first is the way you select talent. You go through a talent selection process that is, I would put forth more rigorous and more focused than many companies that I interact with on a consistent basis. And then the second piece is once they get in, you've created a culture at Cortland that is very unique. What is it other than, to be honest, your fantastic leadership that's allowed for the Cortland culture to build to be what it is? Sure. Um, luckily, I'm not solely depending on my fantastic leadership. Um, the, uh, you know, and the recruiting side, it, you know, we, we began early in this cycle building a process around, um, you know, testing um, applicants that we were hiring, um, personality profiling, uh, intellect testing, um, to really try to build a team of really high performing individuals. Um, you know, as you know, Willie, from your business, you've done a great job with this. You know, high quality individuals tend to want to, you know, it tends to grow on itself. So once you start with a small nucleus of really high quality people, they attract higher quality people who want to work with them. Um, and then, but a lot of it also isn't just about, you know, intellect. It's just, you know, there's a lot of great people who maybe, you know, want something different out of their career than, you know, a different set of people. So it's, it's about getting, starting with a process, you know, through testing and psycho, uh, you know, we use an industrial psychologist um, to do all this work. You know, so part of it's the intellect testing, that's sort of the, the more straightforward part. And then part of it is the profile, you know, the personality and making sure that we're getting folks with the right personality to meet the job that they're going to do. And it doesn't mean the right personality profile to work here or not work here. More typically, it's, you know, the person that's going to be an in interior design probably has a different set of personality profile than the person who's going to be in accounting and reporting. You know, so a lot of that is just about, you know, so much of it's about putting people in the right seat on the bus. Um, but so a lot of effort around, you know, the front end of, you know, considering talent before bringing them in. And then a lot of focus on supporting our talent once they're here. You know, we have a, 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 a very empowering culture. We give, you know, folks a lot of empowerment to, to be, you know, fairly independent in their work. Um, you know, good example, um, you know, we decided about, you know, maybe five years or so ago, you know, we created a, you know, we let everybody know who worked on site, every community manager and service manager, that there is no amount of money that they are not licensed to spend to make a customer happy. And a lot of folks at the time, you know, even internally, we're all very concerned, or a lot, not all of us, but a number of folks were concerned that that could lead to, you know, we're going to blow up our budgets and spend way too much money and all these things. And the reality is, you can count on one or two hands the number of times that somebody really overspent what you would have okayed for them. But, you know, 
the amount of value you created with your team by entrusting them with an unlimited checkbook to make people happy, you know, you can't even put a, a value on that. And that continues to this day, you know, and I can't even remember a single story where we were like, oh my goodness, I can't believe we let them do that. And look what they did. You know, I can, you know, think of many, many stories where they did the right thing for the right reason because they were empowered to go do it, um, you know, through decisions and checkbook. One of the things that um, you talked about standardization in the sense of the experience from a client standpoint, you've also standardized a lot as it relates to the, if you will, fit and finish of a Cortland property. Um, and you've standardized on lock systems, you've standardized on HVAC systems that have allowed you to have property managers who typically, let's just say it was a property manager who lived in Atlanta, had done their stint being a property manager on a Cortland asset, they typically would then kind of, if you will, graduate to either come to corporate or go to some other um, company to find a new job experience. And because you've standardized across the country, that property manager can actually move from Atlanta to Dallas or to Phoenix and find the same systems, the same, that their training that you've given them is sort of applicable across the Cortland platform. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, you know, I'm going to start with the second piece and then I'll go to the fit and finish piece. So, you know, we learned uh, again, five or six years ago, we, we sort of realized that we weren't seeing the same passion, if you will, in our maintenance and, and facilities teams as we were seeing on the other, you know, the, the, the leasing and operations side of the house. And so after digging into that a fair amount, um, you know, we realized that there was really very little, you know, as an industry, we pay very little respect to the folks who are turning wrenches, if you will. Um, and the reality is, if you look at almost every survey about why people move in multifamily, almost every time there's a survey that looks at that, uh, the top reason is because of a bad service experience. So as an industry, we put all the focus on the what's in the office, the talent in the office that's leasing and bringing in new customers. And we put almost no focus on the team that actually keeps our existing customers there which is, you know, in business is the exact opposite way to maximize your, you know, your, your bottom line. So we then, and we realized that a lot of the reason was there was just not a really a, a, a you know, there, there wasn't a, you know, a protocol of really supporting the facilities team as its own function outside of the property, you know, the, the leasing side of the house. So we brought in a, a gentleman um, and broke facil facilities out from the more traditional property operations. And so uh, and created a separate oper reporting funnel, a reporting tower for all of the folks in operations. We then were able to start, you know, investing in those folks, training them better, you know, creating better pathways for them, career pathways. So they didn't feel like they were just gonna be, you know, the service manager of location 22 forever, um, which then creates more energy, as you could imagine, within that group. You can then attract, you know, higher quality folks. Um, and so then once you got the team right was the first piece. And then the next piece was starting to standardize training process. Um, we're moving now into sensors and putting sensors in the equipment so we can start to get proactive um, you know, messaging when things are going to fail instead of waiting until they fail. Um, to your point you made, we've been systemizing appliances and fixtures and plumbing fixtures and all these things. So, you know, you get as much systemization as possible, which makes the, you know, nothing will make the service team's job easier is when things don't break. So if you start by spending a little more on the product itself, which is pennies, I mean, literally pennies in the stuff we're talking about, then you have a much lower failure rate and then a better system of maintaining that product. So, you know, you know, when you have something that's been repaired three times for the same problem, you're probably going to have an issue. You know, the best way to keep your customers happy is for them to not have the air go out in August, not for it to go out and fix it really fast. It's fixing it fast is better than not fixing it at all. But if it never broke, that's the best thing. And so a lot of the system and work we're doing around is preventative maintenance and, you know, system, you know, 
systemizing all of that process to keep that stuff from happening. Um, as it relates to the first part of your question, the fit and finish side, and the for our customers, um, you know, not everybody can afford to move into a brand new high rise apartment. But I would argue that almost everybody has pride in where they live almost and really wants to live in a nice place. It doesn't have to be brand new. It doesn't have to be perfect, but everybody wants to have pride in their, you know, in their place that they live. And so a lot of what we set about to do early, you know, back seven or eight, 10 years ago was, you know, how can we use this value add machine to create really high quality and high touch finish and high touch experience for folks at a price that is affordable. And, you know, that was a result of a fair amount of research where it was pretty clear that despite, you know, the huge uh, boom and, you know, folks moving in town in the early part of the, you know, 2010 decade, you know, in the urban renaissance, which was great, but it just meant that instead of 100% of the new growth being in the suburbs, it was 85% of the new household growth is in the suburbs. You know, you still had the vast majority of household growth taking place in the suburbs where folks were, you know, not making the same type of wages as the folks who were um, moving into these new in-town developments. And so the trick for us was how do you create this really high quality product and finish at a price that's affordable? And that was part of the, you know, the rationale behind us insourcing um, our, our interior design team, which allowed us to create the building materials business, um, which then led us over to Asia to create, you know, the material sourcing part of the business, and then pair that with the construction execution piece, really to systemize that product delivery at a really high quality, but a very affordable price. So I remember walking into your offices, I want to say it was probably around 2015, maybe 2016. And there was a projection up on the wall in the analyst bullpen that had ships literally on the Pacific Ocean where you could track the ships that were bringing across the materials that were going to go into Cortland buildings that you were rehabbing. Um, that's a, that's a, Far, that's a big step from 2005 being focused on developing multifamily properties in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, talk about the move to vertically integrate and going and making partnerships with the OEMs over in China that A, allowed you to standardize product and B, cut your costs dramatically. Sure. Well, I'll tell you how it started. Um, again, we were trying to figure out how to build this machine to create really high quality product, very affordable price, you know, very little volatility in the delivery schedule, et cetera. Um, so because of the challenge of getting really good design talent on a third party basis early in this cycle, and again, that's because, you know, early in the cycle, we were buying and renovating assets that were all foreclosures and many of those assets we paid sub $15,000 a unit. So, you know, this was not the same type of profile we're working on today. And as you can imagine, if you were, you know, an interior design professional, you know, getting the Cortland project to renovate a property that they had just paid, you know, $10,000 a unit to buy and we're going to spend $15,000 a year. Like it wasn't the high glamour uh, project. So, after a while of fighting that battle, we finally decided to, in, you know, we hired um, um, uh, Darla Dillon, who was working for one of the companies that we had uh, hired on a third party basis. And I'll never forget, we were like, okay, Darla's coming in, she's going to do all of our interior design, 100% of it, and we're going to have it, you know, no problem. Um, that team, by the way, is now about 40 people, and we're still, you know, we're still always struggling to stay current, to, to keep up. But anyway, so once we brought that in house, we then realized that, you know, we could do a better job on the material side. And so Darla partnered with Clay Landers, who runs our uh, construction group, and they started working with an importer to, again, we were not going directly to Asia to, to source materials. We were working with an importer to cut out sort of some of the middlemen on this side. Um, 
And like a lot of things that worked great until it didn't, um, worked really well for a few jobs. And then all of a sudden the stuff was delivering more and more slowly. And then that guy disappeared. So, uh, Clay and a, a wonderful gentleman, uh, on his team, um, named Walter Hudson, uh, got on a plane and flew to China to find our missing cabinets and counters at the time. And, you know, Neither of them would have ever been there, had no idea what they were getting into, but we're going to go figure this out. And it literally was sort of that silly, like it, they met with one group who then pointed them to the next group, who then led to the next group. And after a couple visits and, you know, whatnot, real, they realized that, hey, if we can get Darla's team to design these materials, we just found the factories, we can go do this direct and uh, cut out all the middlemen and a lot of the cost. But the really, th the really important thing that was cut out was the volatility of delivery and timing and product quality. You know, by controlling now the design of the materials, and by materials, we're talking sort of everything inside the drywall in a unit, cabinets, counters, tile, light fixtures, plumbing fixtures, flooring, robe hooks, doorknobs, peepholes, you name it. Um, but by controlling that process, you now could control the quality of the product. And when I say as pennies, I mentioned this earlier, the difference in the in a really high quality fixture and versus the lowest builder grade stuff we were used to seeing, it was literally said it is single percent cost difference. And the because you spent so much of the landed costs in the US went to logistics and shipping and whatnot that you know the amount of proper the amount of cost that went into the actual product was really, you know, pretty small. And so it barely moved the needle to go from really low grade to really high grade. Well, so first of all was product design quality. Second was product quality. You know, the, how long will that product last? Third was the ability to now control schedule. So to your point, looking at all the ships on the board, you know, we didn't make the ships move any faster, but at least we now had consistent information about when they were going to get to the port in LA or the port in Florida, when that, you know, they were going to be onboarded on a truck when that truck, and now, you know, and because now all those vendors were reporting or working for us, we couldn't make them be any better, but at least we could, you know, had a line of sight into what was going on and they were working for the owner instead of, you know, a myriad of intermediary, you know, middlemen in between who really didn't care as much as we did about when that stuff showed up. And, uh, you know, so we got great price, we got great product, we got great finish. Most of all, we got great consistency. So when we were promising delivery dates on these units, um, you know, we had much lower volatility than what we had seen previously, you know, doing it in a more traditional model. And is that given the supply chain issues going on today, are those relationships and the and controlling that process a competitive advantage right now uh, at this time in the cycle, given the pandemic and how backed up supply chains are? Sure. Um, it's, Yes, it's been extremely helpful. And in fact, you know, since the pandemic, we have, since the pandemic started in March last year, we have delivered about 7,500 units to date. Um, you know, and so it was a combination of having product on hand, rushing product into manufacture as soon as the, you know, plants reopened in Asia, um, you know, and just, you know, having greater visibility into that whole um, supply chain because it was our business instead of a third party's, you know, really helped us, um, you know, stay ahead of the materials issues and the supply chain issues that are happening. We are definitely being impacted by those supply chain issues. So I'm not going to say they don't, they're not happening, but because we're so much closer to what's going on, we're much closer to the head of the line. So as things, you know, are, are you know, moving around and expectations are moving around, we can adjust on our side so it doesn't slow us down in what we're doing over here. So your um, your brand, your customer experience, and your cost of renovation are all competitive advantages that allow Cortland to um, pay higher for an asset, lower your cost of rehab and then be able to make up for it in the rents you can charge because the combination of lower cost on the rehab and then also the brand on the on the rents allows you to have a unique competitive uh, unique competitive positioning as it relates to acquisitions the market today is 
as white hot as we've ever seen it, Stephen. You know that very well. My team is showing your team. I think your team is underwritten. I think Altman said to me, in the last three years, the acquisitions team at Cortland has underwritten something over 2,500 assets. Um, and so it's a wildly competitive marketplace right now. And you're seeing cap rates continue to chink down and chink down. You just raised your fifth closed end fund. Um, you've got a number of open end funds. So you're raising a lot of capital. What's your view on the overall market right now as it relates to sort of supply and demand and where pricing is and the ability to continue to get the returns that Cortland has been so successful at producing? Sure. Um, well, you know, obviously there is an enormous amount of capital looking to get into multifamily, which is, you know, what's driving down the cap rate environment. Um, we, you know, as cap rates continue to tick down, we're getting closer and closer to zero. So, that, you know, at some point they can't go any lower intuitively. Um, but we do believe that the, you know, all the value we bring to the table to create alpha is good if returns are in the 20s. They're, more, they're better in the teens. They're really, really good, you know, when they hit single digit returns because, the alpha we're creating is somewhat consistent regardless. And so we feel that our model is getting progressively, you know, is creating this alpha through operations and the, the, you know, systemization of the product creation, we think is driving ever enhanced outperformance, the lower cap rates go. Um, you know, we, I'd like to think, and Brad Brown and my acquisitions chief swears we've never paid more than somebody else for a property. Um, <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, but to your point about all the stuff we've underwritten, you know, what we decided, you know, a number of years ago was to invest in a bigger team so we could put an investment team in really each of the markets that they were in. You know, so we weren't trying to do all this acquisition from a central location where we really didn't have the local market knowledge that we would like to have. And so, you know, we probably have 50 some odd people on the investment team and they are spread out across the markets where we're operating in the U.S. And, you know, so that allows us to underwrite, you know, a, a huge volume of potential opportunities. It's really inefficient, you know, over the last three years, we've uh, closed on 4% of the assets we've underwritten. But at the end of the day, if we, you know, take the learnings we're having through our existing portfolio in each of these markets and the learnings we get from the 96% of the assets that we lose on, but we underwrote and got all the data from, and then maintain all of that in a dynamic database and then uh, use a, a good, strong local team that can take that data and take what they know about what's going on in every in their market in every part of their market every day. It just allows us to be better at choosing where to lean into what we're offering versus just throwing a dart at a board and hoping that this deal works. Um, and you know, it just it allows us to be so much smarter when we're underwriting new opportunities, which at the end of the day works to the benefit of our investors because it gives us less volatility on the outcome of the return. If you're, if you're only successful, and by only, it's a very relative term on 4% of the deals that you underwrite, any thoughts about taking the model that you've so incredibly built and applying it to either other asset classes inside of multi or other commercial real estate asset classes? I can only imagine, Stephen, that during the pandemic as hotels and office buildings were sort of sitting on the sidelines and weren't trading because nobody really wanted them. There were opportunities for you to step in and use your ACK rehab capabilities to convert a hotel, for instance, into a multifamily property. Did you, did you focus on that at all? And then on the broader question, any thoughts about taking the model and expanding it out? Yeah. At this time, there's no real, you know, we haven't thought about expanding beyond housing. Um, you know, most of the places where I've made mistakes are when I tried to do something that wasn't housing. Um, so as I've learned along the way, you know, stick to what you know, or at least what you think you know. Um, as it relates to other types of housing, you know, uh, we have looked at, you know, 
whether it's student housing or senior housing. Um, as you know, Willie, we started a brand for 55 plus, you know, which we called a Tiva uh, a number of years ago when we did probably a dozen or so um, projects in that brand. And we've been sort of moving out of that because we just, you know, we had great success, but we think that was more a function of, of market timing and luck than it was an actual really, you know, you know, that that that, that business model made sense for us. Um, so, you know, I, I won't say we won't ever do something different, but we're not looking at something today. We are, you know, looking at other product types within housing. Um, but thankfully, there's so much opportunity, uh, you know, as you know, within multifamily in the markets we're in. You know, if you look at Atlanta, you mentioned we're number one owner in Atlanta, number one owner in Dallas. You know, in both of those markets, we're the number one owner and we're mere basis points of the total, uh, you know, like one or 2% of the total supply. So a lot of room to grow um, in the business that we're doing, which then, you know, empirically, we can see that every additional piece of business we do in a market that we're in really drives some incremental value to all the assets we already have in that market. And in most of your markets, Stephen, you are a top five owner. Um, in a couple, obviously the ones that you're just entering, you're not a top five owner, but is it, is it, is it fundamental to your business strategy to gain those economies of scale in a given city? Or as you get bigger and bigger, do you have the ability to sort of centrally manage everything and be able to have one or two assets in a given market and just be happy that you're in, I'll just pick a market, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina with one or two assets, even though you might not be a top five owner in Charlotte. Sure. Well, first, it's not about being top five or top 10 or, you know, it's really about having the right asset base to operate with a scaled organization. Um, you know, it's less about buying them or renovating them or building them from that standpoint is really on the operations side. And what we've learned is there's just no, I mean, just the value you get out of being scaled in a market, um, you, it, you can't beat it in any other way, centralized, centralized services, et cetera, um, because it's such, it just takes so many people to do it well. Um, you know, in a, in a market like Dallas or Atlanta or any of the markets we're in, we don't need to be top one or five, but, you know, we'd like to, you know, have line the site to, you know, four or 5,000 plus units because it allows us to, you know, first invest in better top notch human capital because we have the scale to support it. It allows us to invest in more unique human capital as, you know, as this business gets more and more experiential, um, you know, there's expectations from our consumer and our customers that are more and more unique. Um, you know, so we need more specialized human capital. Um, it also allows us to, you know, systemize or, or to centralize within a given market, things like maintenance and uh, purchasing, um, et cetera. Um, we recently, by example, rolled out a concept we call the leasing hub, which is instead of having leasing agents in every property um, who are fielding calls um, and inquiries for, from new customers, um, we centralize those folks and then all of those calls come into a central location. So instead of calling, you know, in the more traditional model where if you're looking for an apartment in Denver and you call one of our locations in Denver, you know, if they can't help you, which is fairly likely because all the properties sit at 95% occupied, you know, then all the investment you put into that lead, you know, your associate is like, well, thank you very much for your interest, but we can't help you and call us next year when you need an apartment again. You know, instead of saying, okay, I also have these other 30 locations in this market, let's talk about how we can find the right spot for you if it's not right here. And so there's huge value in that. And that's just one example where that scale just creates a ton of value. The other piece is just in SEO and online through the branding, as I mentioned earlier. You know, the more you know, our brand grows in a given market. So the more locations that we have in a given market, we can see incrementally how it drives search and drives uh, traffic to all of the other markets as all the other assets as well. So, you know, in a, again, back to the Denver example, when we buy asset number 20 in Denver, 
that also helps one through 14 or one through 19, whatever the, the, the balance of them, because it's just incremented. Obviously the incremental benefit goes down each, you know, as you get bigger, but it still continues to drive traffic within the market. You talked at the top of the discussion about capital and about when, you know, Cortland had a thousand units and how hard it was to get LPs to invest in the vision and what you were building. Um, it must be really fun these days to sit down <laughs> with LPs who are basically throwing money at you. Um, but one of the things that you did, Stephen, is you know you brought on amazing talent in 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 Ned and in David and others to really create this capital formation function inside of Cortland. And and as I look at Cortland now, a decade after really you started hitting this growth trajectory. For all of the incredible brand you've built, customer experience you've built, vertically integrated sourcing you've built, and the actual ACK rehab process, you've also created a capital formation machine that is, it's, you know, there are parallels to it like a Blackstone, but there are few who've been able to create the capital formation uh, capabilities that you have at, at Cortland. As you sit there and think about like the next 10 years, what's more important to you, continuing to build on the capital formation side? or continue to stick at, you know, it's the day-to-day -day operations and the blocking and tackling that actually brings the capital. Don't get too excited about AUM. It's more important that we're delivering that service every day. And obviously I know it takes both, but I'm trying to get at a little bit of what's the focus. Sure. Um, you know, we do have a great capital team, you know, Ned, you know, you mentioned Chris Lennon. Um, you can thank Bruce Cohen for the time he spent advising us, putting that team together. You know, that team actually started, Ned joined us um, a number of years ago, but then as we really wanted to grow in the fund business, we talked to a number of groups, a number of placement agents, and really how we ended up building an internal team is all the placement agents we talked to were in complete agreement that there was no need for another multifamily manager. Um, so talk about a, a kick to the pride. I couldn't even pay them to represent us. Um, it but, makes it makes two of us. It makes two of us. <laughs> but you know, sometimes it's good to be you know have more you know more ambition than brains. So we just said, okay, well, we've done a lot of other things ourselves. We'll figure this one out too, um, and you know, begin to build that team, which has been a great add to the organization. But to your point about how we're going to grow, it, it, you know, I'm a big believer. And taking a step back, a lot of the things we talked about today and the differences between us and maybe some of our competitors is we really look at the business as a consumer facing operating business that happens to need capital, as opposed to a capital business that happens to somewhere down the hall have some property operations, frankly, that historically most people, you know, in the C-suite of these businesses deign to get that operational stuff on their shoe. You know, it's just not something people want to deal with, but it's necessary. I think if we're really going to outperform in the new environment of multifamily going forward, that's the part where you got to be best. And so that's really where we, you know, have put most of our resource allocation building inside the platform and want to continue to be out to be able to outperform um, because we feel strongly that, you know, the worst thing we could do, you know, after having a good round of fundraising is then let our returns start to slide because we lose focus on really what's important in the business. You know, so what we talk around about most of the time here is how, you know, all the effort here goes to maintaining that focus on being a great investor and being a great operator. And then the capital will find us, you know, with strong belief that if we continue to perform for the capital, they're going to find us as opposed to, you know, what, often happens is, you know, you take a really good real estate company, it tends to become a really good capital firm because that's where the attention, you know, goes. So as, you as think long back, as I'm here, we'll focus on the operations. Yeah. As you think back over the last decade, take yourself back to 2010, the amount of scale that you've created, which is along with scale success, um, the decisions you get to make today are very different decisions than you made a decade ago. Um, What's the best part of that? And what's the worst part of that? The best part, you know, I will say the best part is if you believe the idea that the 
industry is moving to more of a, a long-term, you know, more of an operating cadence that creates return as opposed to, you know, something more, you know, more typical to what it has been where it's buy an asset and sell it. It's a churning, it's a portfolio churn that creates return. Um, I think what is so much easier today for us having created the capital structure that we have is that, and it really two things, we created the capital structure and built the infrastructure to where now we're not relying on all these external parties for every project. And it just makes us so much better at the execution side of our business because we're not having to go line up, you know, 10,000 moving parts, whether it's a committee approval for this external LP or a, you know, a contractor or a construction and bonding agent or, you know, all these different things that you have to line up when you have no control over your capital. So having built the capital infrastructure to get capital that we then, you know, have control over at the same time of building the execution infrastructure to perform for that capital. I loved it 10 years ago. It was fun every day. Today, it's just a different type of fun because there's not nearly as many, you know, you can do more and do it better because each thing is systemized so much better. So. And anything on the on the downside as it relates to anything from a, the small company touch and feel that you miss or anything that sort of says, man, I wish I could go back to doing that, but my job today just doesn't allow me to do it? I will never say I'd rather leave here to go there, but I do miss the close, you know, five years ago, I knew every single person who worked here, you know, and could walk up and have a conversation and whatnot and, and knew them. Um, you know, I, I do miss that piece. Um, now, I do try to get out as much as I can um, and meet all the folks across the system, but I do miss the fact, you know, that very that, that small family feel where you got to know everybody. And that was a big part of the, the excitement of coming to work every day. Well, as I said at the top of our discussion, um, the partnership between WD and Cortland has been a big part of our success over the last decade. And I'm deeply appreciative of it. And I'm also appreciative of you taking the time to join me today and talk about how you've made Cortland the success that it is today. So um, thank you, uh, Stephen, very much for taking the time. To everyone who listened in today, I hope you enjoyed our discussion. And uh, I look forward to seeing everyone back next Wednesday on another version of the Walker webcast. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Take care. Take care. <laughs>